in a perfect environment, nature runs its own course. However, humans have reached an unprecedented level of influence on this planet. For better or worse, this has fundamentally changed the natural balance. And the ways in which conservation is achieved. Conservation can be a contentious topic. The obligation wildlife managers have to control numbers of certain species really gets under some people's skin. However, today in this video, we're gonna look at a small band of practical conservationists who are still fighting for what wildlife we have left. To touch on the basics of practical conservation, I met with Ant McLernan, a gamekeeper in Southern England. So the basics of conservation, mate, very simple. Three main things, you've got food, habitat, um, and predation. You control those three things and make sure they're all in a nice even balance for whatever species you're looking at, you've got them. Why is it that we have to put these three legs in place in the first place? Because when you talk about you know, the, the wild, there is no longer any truly wild within the UK. You know, there are parts that are more wild than others, but there, are no, there is no truly untouched areas of the UK. We have affected the habitat in such a way that if we do not intervene, the whole balance of, of the UK's wildlife is gonna to topple over and go out of control in, in to, to ways that cannot be reversed. One of the big questions is, how did wildlife get out of balance? So as a people, I know that we just hate the idea of taking on someone else's debt, that we are now still carrying forward a debt that was created thousands of years ago when we killed all the top tier predators that balanced the system for us. And also like, there are way too many people, especially in Britain, it's so densely populated that it's, it now falls on us to make sure that the wild spaces that still exist, all those edges of wildness, um, that we help manage those and bring that balance that was there naturally, that we destroyed, and now we uh, have a debt to pay to the landscape, which is being the balancer. Tending the wild is something we've done as humans since the beginning of time, right? We all evolved together, all of the trees and the land and the plants, and we have been selecting bushes and plants and animals for their health for a really, really long time. We like to now see ourselves as very other from the landscape. And until very recently, we were integral to the landscape and we created, in a lot of places, more abundance through interactions, through positive interactions, even through like, even through like killing, right? We were able to select herds and increase like productivity. Uh, Is oh, it wrong yeah. to, to manage a piece of land for extra productivity? <laughs> no, we have literally done it since forever. Tending the wild is something that all tribal peoples do. As Martin alluded to, the sheer number of people has affected the ecology of our landscape, giving an unfair advantage to certain species. And it's those species that we as humans need to manage. Foxes love humans. They love, they, they are so intelligent and so adaptable that they are able to live in under bins in the middle of towns where no other wildlife apart from rats, other predatory species can survive. You know, you, you never see a ground nesting bird in the high street in London, do you? People seem to care about what we're doing out here because they see it as a barbaric way that we go out and, and, and kill certain species. Um, but they don't care about the extension that's going on their office building onto new ground that wasn't previously built upon, which is taking away habitat from other species. We look at areas of, of ground now, the, the wildlife is probably getting condensed more because of building and encroachment of humans into the countryside that if we do not control that in, uh, and manage it in a way... All numbers are going to decrease. Yeah, everything's going to go down because you've got more top-end pre level predators that are going to kill more lower-end mammals or, 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 you know, or birds. And it's, 
it's just going to knock everything out of balance to end up with single species biodiversity, all the top end predators for a certain period, which is what some people seem to want. You know, they want top end predators in big numbers. But then what happens when the food source below them runs out? Whilst many places in England have changed radically over the last hundred years, there are some places that are still bastions of rare species. Today, I'm going to visit one. This is a grouse moor. So in order to really optimise the success of some of these vulnerable species, what predators do you control? Our main predators that we're controlling on the ground is stoats, weasels, ferrets, rats. And this is, yeah, this is one of the traps that we use um, all year round to, to, to catch these sort of ground predators. So how does this work? Um, so this is a, it's called a dock trap. You've got the cage here with the baffles on the the doors, um, so you've got a double baffling system which protects from non-target species, so you're only catching the, the species that um, we're sort of looking to kill. How many of these small mammals do you trap a year? So annually we're looking to sort of probably take uh, 100 150 stoats off a bait, sort of 50 weasels, something like that, and that's just the same every year. We're, we're catching the same amount year upon year within 5, 10. Um, the weasel numbers fluctuate a little bit with the, with the vol cycles, it's creating that balance, uh, predator-prey balance, taking the same number year on year, as with all the, the sort of predator species on the, on the estate. So just regulating their levels as opposed to wiping them out? Exactly, yeah. What threat do these small mammals pose to the bird species we see here today? So yeah, all the bird species you see on the estate, um, the, the main ones that are vulnerable are ground nesting birds. So the eggs are laid on the ground in a, in a small scrape or a small sort of roughly made nest. And all these ground sort of hunting predators, stoats, weasels, ferrets, rats, um, they'll all be looking for eggs at this time of year. Um, so we're just sort of controlling that level of predators. So these, these really rare, vulnerable sort of wading species, ground nesting species, get a chance to rear a few chicks. What would happen if you stopped trapping? If we stopped trapping, obviously the, the predators would, would, the numbers would rise um, and they would just, they would, within a year, two years, um, a lot of these rare waders' nests would, would be eaten within yeah, one or two seasons. From this beautiful lake, we took a walk around Ian's trapping line to see if he'd been successful. Here we've caught a big dog stoat, Johnny, in uh, one of our new Tully traps. You see it's probably hunted up this wall back here. So when you're trapping stoats, you're sort of thinking like a stoat. Um, so here we are, we've caught it. Been a good clean kill. It's come through the external gate. So this is sort of keeping anything from sticking its head in. We've got an internal baffle there. Stoats gone onto the plate, really quick clean kill. But these, these stoats are the sort of lethal killers. How long does it take to reach the equilibrium between predator and prey here? When we first started on the estate here, um, there's some quite high numbers of stoats. It took us a couple of years just to get them down to that level, um, that predator prey level, um, to give the waders a chance to, to increase. Uh, and now we're, we're at that level. And uh, since, uh, since you started reducing the numbers, you've seen, seen the waders rise? We have, yeah, yeah. The, the estate have been doing BTO standard uh, BBS surveys that have been done since the 80s. It's shown when we started um, to improve the keeping on the estate that the uh, wader numbers uh, went through the roof and all bird numbers went through the roof. Yes, yeah, so here we have one of the COVID traps that we, we run on the estate, uh, Johnny. Jack Dawes would take eggs, they're obviously the Corvid family, they're very clever birds. They're hunting, looking for, for nests all the time. They'll watch the hens come off the nests, any species of, of bird, and then they'll be in there taking the, the, uh, the eggs from the nest, and the chicks, they'll take young chicks as well. Do you take a similar number every year, a bit like you do the stoats? Yeah, exactly the same. Uh, it's just keeping that, uh, that level, that balance. Um, we probably kill the same amount of carriers and jackdaws every year. So I know some people have uh, problems with uh, taking life to, to save another life, but um, these stoats that we're trapping, uh, they're real efficient killers, um, real efficient predators, uh, and they're in good numbers. Um, a lot of the predator species, all the legal predator species, are all on the increase, and we're trying to save um, these really rare red-listed species, these ground-nesting species that are really struggling elsewhere in the country.
The only thing we haven't really spoken about is raptors. Do you have a lot of raptors here? We have, yeah, most of the, the raptor species, um, so sort of living and breeding on the estate. Does the predator control you do help the raptors? A fox would take a hen area nest, yeah, it's been, it's been caught on, on camera before. Um, they're a ground nesting bird. And with a, with a harrier nest or a raptor nest on the moor, they're bringing in sort of dead prey. Um, so once the, that, that prey has been there for a day or two and starts to smell a bit, it's gonna, gonna lure. Makes them more, lure more target. Yeah, it does. It lures predators in, they can smell it more. So they're more of a target, I would say, than a, than a wader with its, its little scrape. It's not just predators that are controlled in the name of conservation. The UK has a prolific population of six species of deer. There are around about two million deer in the UK is the most recent estimate, wild deer, in an island of 65 million people. That's a lot of, lot of animals. We've got six different species uh, ranging in size, two of which are, are native species, which are roe deer and red deer, and then we've got fallow deer, seeker, muntjac and Chinese water deer. For the deer, it's a real success story, but for flora, for trees and for certain species of plants in, in certain areas where the densities are too high, it's not a success story, it's completely the opposite. The deer are damaging that environment they're living in, they're thriving in. And one of those can eat the same amount of food as two sheep. So we've, we've got a problem in our, in our woodlands where these deer are, are browsing and grazing and on our agricultural lands where the farmer trying to grow food to feed the 65 million people that live here and the two million herbivores are, are impacting on that. About four, four years ago there were some estimates done that we need to cull about a quarter of a million deer a year to maintain the current population. So if we're not hitting that quarter of a million a year, the numbers will go up. Like with any animal, if you let the numbers get too high, the health of the herd will decrease. There's only so much food available in this island. The only option we have available to us to reduce the damage is through lethal control. Um, I, I've been reading a lot recently about introduction of predators such as wolves or lynx. Um, it's just not a viable option. It, we can't release a top line predator into the same environment we're saying we've got these herbivores doing it where we have livestock, pets, um, rare species, ground nesting birds. So we can't release another top line predator in my opinion. Human beings, since we found the first stone plough, have been cultivating and changing the landscape and makeup of this island. And we can control these deer species. Given the scale of conservation management that needs to be done in the UK, there is inevitable conflict between those on the ground and those sat in government. I put it to Ant, did he feel pressure from theoretical conservationists? Yeah, of course, you know, it's easy to sit behind a computer and tap the numbers up and tell somebody how it needs to be done and how it's gonna work. But you know yourself, it's very, very, difficult, very different when you get into the practical scenario of what works and, and, and why it would work. Why do you vote for a, a certain politician in a certain area? Because he's the guy who's on the ground who goes around and, and knows what the issues are and sees where the money needs investing. You know, you cannot say the whole of the UK is, is, is short of red kites when you can go up the A3 sort of 50 mile and see 60 red kites over the top of the A3. Surely they're not overpopul you know, underpopulated in that area. So would that area be more beneficial to have some of those numbers taken out or relocated? Yes, you can, you can take people to that area and, and, and build bird watching the towers and say, look, you know, come and have a look at all our red kites. But why don't we go and look at everything under them in the food chain and see how that is adversely affecting those species? You know, surely, surely it would be better to have, you know, gamekeepers are your local politicians for wildlife. You know, go and see them. Let's have a look what's in that area. Let's have a look what needs managing. Let's have a look what's doing really well and what's not. And, and together make up a plan of, of what would help that habitat. You've got to look at it in each individual case and decide what every environment and habitat needs individually. The way we're blanket, blanket managing things at the moment, which is not our doing, which is what the people above us are saying, is, is, is wrong. It's not going to work. In my eyes, we need to get, you know, you need to know your ground, know what you've got in place, 
and manage it accordingly. But it's not just those making and influencing the laws. There have been a public perception change over the last 20 years. Putting into motion a more direct conflict between people and land managers. Does the high human traffic you get here affect the conservation work you do? Yeah, hugely. Yeah, I mean, we've already seen visitor numbers down in that river bottom and the place is just void of wildlife. Nothing down there at all? No, no. How can you expect it to what be? What should be in there? It should be full of dippers. It's a beautiful stream, there's no pollution in it. You know, it should be teeming with wildlife in there. But just disturbance alone, that's the major factor down so there. disturbance and conservation just don't go together? No, no. Impossible. What's your interaction with these people like? Not good. You know, we're subjected to abuse all the time. You know, whether it's asking people politely to not have barbecues or put dogs on lead, all we get is, you know, verbal abuse and threats of physical violence. Do people cause a lot of damage? Yeah, we get a lot of damage, traps, snares, all our legal predator control methods. We've got some areas now where we can no longer carry out any legal predator control. We can't have a trap set for it either getting stolen or damaged. It's not just da damage. You know, we've had incidents where traps have been taken from legally set environments in tunnels or on bridges. We've had restrictors taken off so non-target species can get in. And the worst incident we had was 12 months ago, we had fen traps taken out of a tunnel and faced on, placed on top of uh, fence posts. And why is that bad? It's an active pole trap. Could catch raptors, could catch anything. Um, and we rung the police and the police response was poor. And Purely to get you in trouble? Oh, undoubtedly. Yeah, I mean, that followed a meeting, a wildlife group meeting in Glossop the week before. It was no coincidence. You know, there's so much vile rhetoric on the internet now. You know, this is just, it's becoming commonplace now. At times I wonder, uh, but ultimately we've got to be here, we've got to keep going. Um, constantly subjected to verbal abuse, violence, and it, it's having a major impact on certainly the young keepers in Peak District. Uh, you know, it's really hard down here now to keep hold of staff because why would they stay when should, they're being threatened? You shouldn't need to be treated like that, yeah. No, I mean, it's not acceptable in any other workplace. I mean, just recently we've got a local estate, we've got an animal rights extremist group putting the names, face and the home address on social media. And the young lad's been driven out. You know, his, his girlfriend was terrified. You know, and it's, we're rural workers, you know, we're good people but we're just being subjected to this constantly. What would happen if you stopped? Well, it goes the same as every other bit of uplands where there's no management, whether it's down in north of Wales or Lake District. I mean, just out here, you know, there's nothing out there. There are certain people out there that would paint these gamekeepers as indiscriminate killers. From my experience, this just isn't true. These guys love wildlife. I asked Dan if he ever had empathy towards the animals he has to control. Of course, you know, and if I didn't have to control those species, then we wouldn't. But the reason we do it is because it needs, there is a need for a balance. There is a need for a balance. There are ways in which you can do it that, that ensure that it is done more humanely. You know, if you kill um, the adult foxes in the early part of the year before they have cubs, then you're controlling an adult animal that's not had dependent young um, and you're nipping it in the bud before it becomes a problem. There's a part of me that, that does feel a lot of empathy to, to some of the species we control. Um, you know, as I've said before, foxes are, I love foxes, you know, they're, they're my favourite species. They're so intelligent, so bright, so good looking, but they are such a menace to what we do and, and, and to, to the entire countryside, not just what we do, but to the entire countryside. And for that reason, they need to be controlled. To me, this subject has always appeared black and white. However, in order to grow as a human and a conservationist, you have to take on board different opinions and different thoughts. So I asked Ian and Martin, 
why do they think people have a problem with killing for conservation? Death is really difficult, especially as we disassociate ourselves more and more from death of our own mortality or from anything mortality, from any mortality at all, right? We don't see the death of even plants very often. Someone else picks that for us. You don't see them rotting in place. You don't see there being a brown space of earth where it was green. You don't see, um, you don't see your animals die, you don't engage them in any way, you pick them up in a packet and that's very convenient. It allows us to live in this like Olympian paradise where we are the gods and things appear as if from nowhere. And it's, it's a beautiful thing and it's this sort of classic idea of growth which I think is exceptional. That we are going towards this like we are the gods now moment and it does feel incredible to be part of that moment in history. However, Rising to the idea of godhood and being of a higher ideal means that we, we can't be associated with the dirtiness of death. We can't be in Olympus and Hades at the same time. So the thing that people are trying to do, I think is really admirable. But actually, if you see in any culture where they have to butcher their own meat, they don't have so much issue with death because you're constantly engaging with it. So I think the problem is, isn't this or that, it's just a fear of death, a fear of mortality and the idea that death is bad and there is no middle ground, there's no concept that makes them understand that like death is a natural part of life and that without the death of one thing, you will cause the death of other things. If you do not manage a top tier predator, it will go out and do what it does, which is kill more. So if we have taken away a huge balancer in the system and then we need to manage that balance, the, the, then we will have cascading imbalances down the system. So going back to the God idea, to be God, to be those gods that we are trying to say, those are higher ideals, we also need to embrace the fact that that means we also have to become a balance. We have to take responsibilities that Godhood, that we like to profess, gives us. So the ultimate question is, Ian, is all of the predator control worth the conservation benefit to all of the rare species? Yeah, definitely, because um, we're up here every day. Um, we see the sort of predator-prey interaction. It's shifting all the time, different species, especially with the, the weather cycles and the weather patterns changing all the time. We see the different um, species, um, some um, doing well, some not so well. We see the numbers of predators there is and we, we know the damage they do. Um, we've been brought up in the dales, we, we love watching wildlife. You're up here, you're, you're not just watching the grouse broods, you're watching the wild pheasant broods, you're watching the weirder chicks and then you're looking for predators. Um, but it's great watching a litter of cubs, um, it's great watching a brood of stoats work in the wall, um, but we, we know the, they have to be controlled because we know the damage that they can do. But definitely the way we've been doing it over years, I think we've proven it works and it's just shown now we are the last stronghold for a lot of really rare species um, on these um, upland uh, moors managed for grouse shooting. This island we call home is far from perfect. We have affected every last piece of the landscape, creating a paradise for some and causing devastation for others. Like it or not, we do have a debt to nature. Our need for food, housing and recreational spaces have shaped our landscape into what it is today. Is it wrong to kill one species to save another? To sit back and watch the last safe spaces for these vulnerable species disappear? The reality is that until we have these prolific generalist predators under control, and farmland landscapes change, it's our responsibility to keep these havens safe.
gamekeepers are not wiping out predators, but rather regulating populations to give these protected species a chance. It may appear a prey heavy balance, but gamekeepers are the last line of defense between these species and possible extinction.